If you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, turn once again to Jude's epistle. God has provided for us his very word, able to teach us, to train us, and to build us up in all righteousness. We do well to listen to what the creator has said. Three verses will be our focus this morning, verses 14 through 16. Follow along as I read. Jude 14 through 16. It was about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loudmouth boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. Well, we desperately need the Lord's help this morning, so let's turn to him in prayer asking for his guidance. Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me. For in you my soul takes refuge in the shadow of your wings. I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. I need you. Oh, I need you. Father, that is a true statement for each of us this morning. How we need you. Your holy word to teach us. Your spirit to guide us. Jesus, speak through me this morning. Open the ears of those who are listening. And may your Holy Spirit do a mighty work this morning. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Every journey has its end, and our study in Jude is rapidly coming to a close. Verses 14 through 16 are the climax of Jude's condemnation towards the people he is speaking about. It is the final nail in the coffin for those who were once hidden but have now been exposed. In his final blow, Jew relies not on what he or the church can do in response to these people, but on what God does in response to these people. We've seen this throughout Jude's letter. Jude isn't going to take up upon himself the necessity to gather a mob with torches and pitchforks against these people. What he is doing is he is seeking to warn the church about the folly that they are prone to fall into. From the very beginning, Jude makes it clear that wrath and ultimate judgment doesn't come from us. It is God's work. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. We don't bring wrath. Because if it weren't for God's mercy and grace, we would be in the exact same place as these people. The only thing that we have to boast in is the undeserved kindness of the Lord Jesus. Brothers and sisters, wipe away your pride and think back to who you were before Jesus. You were like these people following your sin, lost in your transgressions, but also think to your conversion. Why you? Why did you come and repent of your sins? It wasn't because you were more deserving or better than others, nor did you do something different. No, it was because of Jesus. You are not 
more spiritually inclined than others. But Jesus, without condition, chose you as an instrument of grace before the foundation of the world was laid. This is the story of Scripture. God showing favor to people who in no way deserve it. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. What business does a wretch like you and like me have in the courts of God? How can the lost be found and the blind see? It is only through amazing grace, God's unmerited favor, that he shows to whom he pleases. In grace, there is much room for praise and worship, but there is no room for boasting. For we have done none of that mighty work. It is from beginning to end a work of God. Keep this in mind, friends, as we look at these verses. These people's fate was to be ours if it wasn't for the kindness of Jesus. That is all that separates us from them. While much could probably be said on these verses, our focus this morning will be on three clear points that can be made. First, Jesus comes again. It's there in verse 14. Have a look. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones. Here in verse 14, Jude takes us back thousands of years to the time before Noah. Jude speaks of Enoch, the seventh from Adam. Interestingly enough, just seven generations from Adam there were prophetic claims being made about the end of the world. In my studies this week, I found an interesting citation I wanted to share with you this morning. Quote, The earth is deteriorating today. Bribery and corruption abound. Children no longer obey their parents. Every man wants to write a book. And it is evident that the end of the world is fast approaching. That sure sounds like the time that we live in. But that citation is an English translation of an Assyrian tablet found nearly 3,000 years, or written nearly 3,000 years before Christ. Brothers and sisters, the idea that our generation is the last generation is not new to our own time. From the very beginning, people have been thinking in this way, and yet while we are quick to jump to that conclusion, the day of Christ's return is fixed in time. A generation comes, a generation goes, and that can be of great disappointment to us if all we fixate our minds on is trying to know the day and the hour that Scripture tells us we cannot know. Brothers and sisters, from the beginning of time, human minds have sought to understand the end of time. We have an itch to know what is going to happen and when. But the Bible makes a point to say very little about what is to come, and what is said is open to various interpretations. Two people can examine the same passage and understand two very different things about the end times. The main things are the plain things, and the plain things are the main things. Seasons and times have not been made clear to us in the sure guide of Scripture. But what has been made clear is that Jesus will return again. That whether in our own day or 10,000 years from now, he will come again in the flesh. 
Not as a suffering servant as he came before, but as a victorious king having conquered all of his enemies, the last being death itself. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, is a man of whom much speculation has been made both by Jewish tradition and by the Mormon church of our own day. The Bible, however, has very little to say about Enoch. Genesis 5, 21 through 24 tells us this about Enoch. It says, when Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. Now this is all we are told about Enoch in the pages of Holy Scripture. He stands out as the only person in the generations of Adam who did not die. We are not told why or how. We are only told that it happened. Jewish literature engaged in significant speculation about Enoch, and through their speculation, Enoch became regarded as a recipient of heavenly visions and revelations that were recorded in a three-volume work known as the Book of Enoch. It is from this first volume of this book that Jude is citing this prophecy. I caution you, however, from interacting with the books of Enoch. They are no sure guide in the paths of God. And in fact, they oftentimes contradict what God has said in his holy word. Jude is not citing this prophecy authoritatively, but rather, like he did in verse 9 with the assumption of Moses, he is referencing sources his audience is familiar with to make his point in a stronger way. This prophecy is not original to Enoch, however. This citation is on track with what we know to be true from Scripture. Certainly, the Bible is very clear that Jesus will return. And while we ought to reject the books of Enoch as a whole, this prophecy is valid as it lines up with what we have been given in the Bible. Jesus comes again. This has been forgotten by our society and indeed even our churches. Our churches in America have lost sight of the main point of the end times. That is Jesus himself. His name glorified. The praise of his glory. It's about him. Yet in so many churches, all that is discussed is how it will all play out. The focus is on seasons and times and figuring out the timeline. And so now what we find all too often are sermons about Christ's return that are void of Christ and authoritative statements made by churches that the Bible is not clear on. Brothers and sisters, I do not know how the future is going to go, and you do not know how the future is going to go. But what we can know and know more and more each day is Him, is Christ, Him born, Him crucified, Him resurrected. All of time is in his hands. It's all about him, past, present, and future. He is the focus. So let's make him the focus of our minds and our thinking. However long or short the wait is from our perspective, Jesus will return in due time. And when he does, he will transform us to be like himself. Jesus comes again. That is our first point. And Jesus judges. That is our second point. It's there in the text. Have a look. Verse 
15. Verse 15, to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Society tells us the Jesus that I know doesn't judge anyone. He only loves. He only affirms me. Revelation 19, verses 13 through 15. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. This is the Jesus of the Bible. He came once to express God's grace and deliver the elect by way of his blood. And he is coming again to express God's wrath and judgment against the ungodly. There is a day of judgment. It is set. It is coming. Jude tells us that the Lord is coming to do two things. First, to execute judgment to all. He is always just in his judgment and true with his condemnation. None shall stand against him. And second, the Lord comes to convict all the ungodly of all their acts of ungodliness. The word convict there has a sense of exposing something. Or rather, what could be said is to bring a person to a point of recognizing wrongdoing. When Jesus comes in judgment, All will be painfully aware of their own wrongdoing. All of their actions, thoughts, and blasphemous words will finally catch up with these people and those like them. First, Christ comes again. Second, Christ judges. And our third point is Christ saves. Christ saves. It's the whole story of the Bible. Brothers and sisters, we are those who ought to fear the Lord's return. We are all wicked sinners, broken God's law, his words neglected. Yet if you are here today and you are in Christ, you have no reason to fear the Lord's return. For on that day, When you stand in judgment, the book of your trespasses shall be opened, and upon examination, it will be found to be blank. Why? Because God has canceled the record of debt that stood against you with its legal demands. These he set aside, nailing it to the cross. This is the joy of a Christian Our sin is gone. In its place, Christ's righteousness, his robes for mine. Oh, wonderful exchange. Clothed in my sin, Christ suffered beneath God's rage. Draped in his righteousness, I stand justified. For Christ suffered in my place. For some... Jesus will return, the long-awaited Savior and King for others. He will return as a wrathful judge. And Jude gives us a final description of those who have reason to fear the Lord's return. Have a look at verse 16. These are grumblers malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loudmouth boasters showing favoritism to gain advantage. 
They are grumblers, always complaining, never thankful. They are malcontents. They complain about their lot in life. These people choose a variant lifestyle and then complain that it is their unfortunate fate. They follow their own sinful desires. This harkens back to verse 11 with the way of Cain that these people choose to walk in. They are loudmouth boasters. Their arrogance leads them to draw attention brashly to themselves through their boasting. And finally, they show favoritism to gain advantage. They are shrewd. They know who to please, and it isn't God that they seek to please. Brothers and sisters, if we're honest with ourselves, we know we are all quick to drift into such characteristics. But we need to honestly ask ourselves, do any of these characteristics define us, mark our daily living? Are we grumblers? Is all that comes out of our mouth negative? Do we complain about where God has placed us? Do we put on an act when we are at church, but really are following after our sinful desires? Are we loudmouth boasters? Can we not stop talking about ourselves? Do we work shrewdly with others to gain advantage? We ought to examine our hearts and watch our tendencies so that we do not become a slave to such things. Jude is really clear here. Those who, marked, who are marked by such things are those that Jesus will come again in judgment. May it never be, brothers and sisters. We are those who Christ has redeemed let us never turn to such things so that when Christ returns, we are those who rejoice and not those who shrink back in fear. Do we live as though Christ is returning? I've noticed a strange trend in American Christianity. Christians in this country don't believe Jesus is coming again. You may be thinking to yourself, that's absolutely ridiculous. How can I say such a thing? Of course, Christians believe Jesus is returning. And to you, I say, if they believed he was returning, they would live like it. Instead, what we find all too often today is many in the church who call themselves Christians are more worried about their weekend plans and TV shows than they are about being found faithful when Christ returns. My friends, do you believe Jesus is coming again? And does your way of life match that belief? Because if you are in Christ, nothing in this life matters more than being found faithful when Christ returns. To hear the Lord one day say, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into my glory. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. That is my hope and my prayer for each of you here today. What are you living for? Is it this life alone or is your mind on eternal things? This momentary life is passing away. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what is done for Christ shall last. Is your mind focused on what shall last or are other things quickly distracting you from the glory that is to come? Do the toils and the struggles of this life take your attention over the future that we have in Christ? I will leave you with this this morning. Paul's words to the Romans. 
For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. The sufferings and the joys of this life both one day will vanish. And all that remains is Jesus and his glory. Let's pray. Holy Father, thank you for your precious words that teach us about the Lord Jesus. And I ask that, Lord, you would convict hearts. If there are any here who do not know you, that they would come to know you. Jesus, thank you for this time. Thank you for those that you have bought with your precious blood. It's in your name.